In 1940, an exhibition was held in Wellington celebrating our first centenary. 100 years of advancement, achievement and progress. We had every reason to be proud. We had come from this old timer of the early 19th century, the tracks for which the hardy pioneers had hewn out of the virgin forest and hillside, to this symbol of 20th century progress. Several thousand workers are carried to and from their work every day by this electric train. Whereas in 1860, Mother used to have to go to town like this, in a little over half a century, the men of New Zealand, her husband, her sons and brothers, by working hard, had made this possible for her daughter. Another outstanding example of our progress is evident in the size and extent of our civil airline. It is perhaps significant that the exhibition was held alongside Rongatai Aerodrome, Wellington, and the actual site of the exhibition is planned to form part of that aerodrome as it expands. Here is New Zealand as those visitors would describe it. Scenically, it carries some of the best country in the world. In fact, these are the views we send overseas as only typical of New Zealand. Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. Yes, we celebrated 100 years of progress, 100 years of developing and improving the country. But what of this scene of desolation? In striding forward, we'd made at least one vital mistake. This farmhouse was not abandoned because the farmer was making enough money to improve his dwelling, but because his land was no longer yielding him an adequate return. Along our roadsides, this sort of thing is now becoming a common sight. Closely allied to that abandoned home, a note of warning is sounded by them that cannot be ignored. If these are roadside scenes, what of the upper country not seen by the casual motorist? Let us take a look. The place chosen is in the Marlborough district of the South Island, Molesworth by name, and it comprises one 120th of the total grassland of New Zealand. The nearest town, Blenheim, is 85 miles from the Molesworth run. The casual motorist in the vicinity of this town would see the finest flat green pastures and cultivated fields. Expert driving over the Grade 15 road towards Molesworth takes us up a matter of 3,000 feet. We gradually get into the rock-strewn, barren upper country. We ford the river 14 times, and the further we go, the worse the land seems to be. Perhaps a better idea of the topography of this country can be gained from the alternative method of access, aircraft. Here we are flying up the Arbitrary River, gaining altitude all the time. That warning note of soil erosion is best understood from up here. Our pilot has seen it before and comes low near the Molesworth homestead to give a close view of sheet and gully erosion on a sunny slope. In less than 40 minutes, we locate the homestead below and circle for a landing. By road, this trip would have taken at least six hours. Obviously, the landing strip is only a makeshift one and cannot be used in all weathers. Here, the climate is variable and subject to sudden change. Our pilot, therefore, takes early leave. In doing so, we repeat, he leaves us 85 miles from the nearest township, 85 miles from a doctor, train or bus, virtual isolation. We in turn get a closer look at that homestead commanding over a quarter million acres. From here emanated the get-rich-quick policy that ruined the land. Yes, ruined the land. When they took over, Molesworth was almost entirely covered with waving tussock grass, symbol of rich fertility. In 1938, when this farm was abandoned, 60% of it had gone completely. In less than a hundred years, the soil had become eroded and practically useless for farming purposes. Instead of waving tussock, this scabweed was a common sight. Everything good in this particular plot of land has been thrashed out of it. And here we see nature's desperate effort to regenerate and heal the wounded soil. For our own benefit, and for the sake of those who follow us on the land, let us examine closely what caused this tragedy. First of all, it should be emphasized again that this is a place where temperatures and climate are subject to extreme change. Dry and hot in the summer, yet it is always snow-clad and bitterly cold in the winter. 14 degrees of frost at night is quite common between two noon temperatures of over 80 degrees. In 
In 1850, Molesworth was first leased from the Crown. To it was later added a large area known as Tarndale, making a total of 320,000 acres in all. Despite the long, hazardous approach, they used to come in from Christchurch in those days, great herds of cattle were soon grazing on this virgin soil. In 1855, sheep were introduced. Their numbers steadily mounted, and in 1888, 50,000 are recorded as being shorn. At that time, 75 men were employed. By far the greater percentage of this run is mountainous. Unmolested, it had fought a hard fight with nature to secure a thin soil cover. There is no suggestion that stock shouldn't have been grazed here. But, as usual, regrettably, too many were attempted. Glaring proof of this is offered by these fence lines. Where there has been no stock, the vegetation is reasonably good. The other side speaks for itself. The feed obviously began to diminish, and man, seeing a challenge in the loss of nutritious grasses, commenced burning the inedible but abundant tussock grass in order to force the growth of the edible green shoots. In actual fact, he was only helping the ruin of his own property. The hardy tussock protected the other grasses, but it couldn't stand up to the continual fire attack. On the hillside, the tussocks used to hold the soil in place. Note the original depth, solely attributable to the holding nature of the top vegetation. But when under constant menace from burning and overgrazing, that self-same top surface was stripped and compacted, and one of the prime causes of soil erosion, water strangely enough, was allowed to run off rather than into the soil. With nothing to hold it, the water action was one which simply carried the soil away in sheets. leaving ugly scars like this. From here, the process of degeneration was inevitable. Water continued to carry the soil away, and in addition, frost pulverized it, and wind carried away large quantities whenever the ground was dry. Referring again to that water, it will be easy to understand the old adage that large oak trees from little acorns grow. Note the small gully made by the temporary running water. The advance to this tragic site is not hard to understand. What is going to happen here? More water runoff will open up more ground, and this ultimate result is now inevitable unless countermeasures are taken. In the winter time, the runoff is permanent, and you can actually see the shingle being carried downhill onto the slope. With this particular gully, the extent of the encroachment is easily seen. It has buried the fence in its relentless march, covering acres of good tussock pasture, and is over ten feet deep on a gentle slope. In all cases, of course, the water-driven rocks and shingle finally reach the rivers. The ever-widening solid mass diverts the natural course of the river, and further erosion takes place. This erosion, once started, is a constant, never-ending action that has only one result, destruction. Nature, left alone, will win its own fight, but where man interferes without due regard to what he is doing, if overgrazing or constant thoughtless burning are indulged in, as was the case here at Molesworth, then this type of thing, a threat to our very existence, is inevitable. Grazing was not entirely due to man's avarice. Not only too many sheep and cattle were responsible, the destructive rabbit in uncontrollable numbers also fed off the land. Deer, imagining themselves safe, wandered down onto the gentle slopes in search of food. Goats too, an equal if not greater menace, were always increasing in numbers. Another contributing factor to be remembered in examining the story of this losing fight with nature is that the decreasing amount of food was often hidden in the wintertime. The number of animals lost because of snow was in direct proportion to the diminishing food supply. But for the very tall tussock known as snow grass and the otherwise menacing briar bushes, even greater numbers would have died. It was only natural that the animals should concentrate on those slopes facing the sun, where the snow melted first and uncovered the food. Everywhere the sunny faces have suffered the worst erosion.
80 years then, the productive capacity had declined from approximately 30,000 pounds a year to an economic failure. The stock was sold and the land handed back to the lands department. It cannot be overemphasized that this was not the only place where soil erosion had taken place. It was rearing its ugly head everywhere, the greatest menace New Zealand had ever faced. The government took action and a Soil Conservation Council was formed to fight it with everything at its disposal. No time was lost. A war on erosion was declared. At Molesworth, that meant many things. Help the Lands and Survey Department to destroy all rabbits. Here was a chance to watch the results of an all-out conservation campaign. Many miles of rabbit-proof fences were already erected. More were undertaken. But, as you can see, rabbits are not easy to hold in. Rabbiters, miles from the homestead, but visited every now and then with stores, live on the job for months at a time. Those rabbiters are poisoning with strychnine. Carrots are used as a bait and lines are laid as often as possible. Under the Lands and Survey Department, 70,000 rabbits were destroyed in 1939. The annual cost of this policy alone has been over a thousand pounds, and still they are numerous. The war goes on. 4,400 deer are reported to have been shot in six months. The war on them too is not spasmodic, but continuous. Because cattle and sheep have been kept off the land, there are signs everywhere of regeneration. The country is definitely coming back. Tall and low, tussock are growing again. Coxfoot, Timothy and White Clover are all taking hold. Lines of pine trees have been planted with a view to acting as a windbreak. Oats, carrots and yes, even potatoes have been sown with success. Experimental sowing of varied grasses in a special rabbit-proof plot have indicated what can be done. In really favorable areas, feed has become so abundant that the Lands and Survey Department is now running 2,700 head of cattle. The conservation policy, therefore, is practically paying for itself. What then has been accomplished? What has the conservation policy really amounted to? Sheep have been kept off the property altogether. Rabbits have been destroyed and prevented from gaining control. Deer have been exterminated. Goats, too, have been ruthlessly shot. Only a limited number of cattle under constant observation have been allowed to graze. A constant watch is kept on wind and weather. Acres of land have been ploughed and top dressed. Widespread sowing of grasses has been undertaken. A special area consisting of some of the worst erosion has been fenced off and continual experiments are being conducted which indicate what can and should be sown to maintain ascendancy over this problem land. These men have only just begun their work and they need your help. Total war has been declared on soil erosion and every farmer, whatever his situation, whatever his type of farm, is asked to enlist. Our forebears unwittingly created this situation. It's no use blaming them. If they'd had any idea of the trouble they were starting, erosion would not be the menace it is today. That is the point, if they'd had any idea. This threat is very often impossible to see. Your land right now may be menaced. Remember, if you wake up too late, it means ultimate abandonment, poverty and desolation for someone. This is New Zealand. This is the New Zealand we tell the world about the New Zealand of which we are justifiably proud. This prosperity was Molesworth. Your son and the future generation look to you to see that this is the type of land they too will be able to farm. Are you sure that you don't need advice? If you do, don't hesitate to contact the Soil Erosion and Rivers Control Council, Wellington.